Well, thanks. Thanks everyone for joining us. We're going to get started. First, I want to say thanks to Schult, Roth, and Zabel for hosting this session. A beautiful law firm here in, in New York City. If you have any law needs, go to go to them. They're definitely going to invite us back after that ringing endorsement. So let's let's start and just do some brief introductions. Just a little bit about yourself, your background, what you're passionate about. Dr. Yusum, go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and it's such a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm Dr. Anna Yusum. I'm a psychiatrist and executive coach. I'm on faculty at the Yale School of Medicine. Actually, that's where I went to medical school myself. My passion is the intersection between mental health and spirituality, and I'm actually in the process of starting a mental health and spirituality center at Yale, which will be a bridge between the medical school and the divinity school. I'm doing this together with Dr. Christopher Pittenger in the Department of Psychiatry, and that's really my passion. That's what I wrote my book about. My book is called Fulfilled, How the Science of Spirituality Can Help You Live a Happier, More Meaningful Life, and the current book I'm working on is called Expecting the Science of Miracles and How You Can Draw Miracles into your life. I think it's so fascinating. I mean, this, the science of religion, the science of miracles, it's not, those aren't typically things you hear together, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go. Daria, thank you so much for joining us. Daria is joining us from, from Poland. Uh, welcome. And please, please give us a brief introduction on yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you today, even online. My name is Daria Rzavtseva. Uh, my field of expertise is Web3 and creative tech. I'm working with art tech startups across the world, like from the USA, from Europe, Asia. And currently, I'm the head of business development and partnerships at Fuel Arts, an investment platform based in New York and Miami. And my passion actually is intersection of art and technology and also creativity. Thank you so much, Daria. Really excited to hear your input as we go through our conversation today. Next up, we have Charlie Isaacs. Charlie, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming and uh, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Charlie Isaacs. I'm the CTO for Customer Connection at Salesforce. We're a cloud company and we just finished our Dreamforce event last week where we had 45,000 of our closest friends join us in a love fest in San Francisco, and it was all about AI. And my one of my passions is AI, and one of my passions is helping our customers imagine the future. And in my role, I focus a lot on Internet of Things, but lately it's been the intersection of Internet of Things and AI and uh, all things technological, but at the same time, and we're gonna talk about this today, it's also about giving back because um, we like to think of Salesforce as a platform for change. And uh, we donate a lot of money and a lot of the employees time and some of our profit into uh, nonprofits at Salesforce. And as a result, I get to uh, do a lot of engagements with nonprofits and I get to do a lot of giving back. And that's what I'm passionate about. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlie. It's great to hear that business doesn't just have to suck the world dry, but there is an opportunity for business to be a platform for change. Bishop Alistair, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to hear a little bit about yourself. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. And it's a great privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Alistair Redfern. I'm a bishop in the Church of England. I was a bishop of the diocese. I now work on issues of modern slavery, trafficking, refugees. Um, I'm very keen to be involved in this discussion because one of the things that I observe is that there is enormous progress, in inverted commas, through science and technology, and most of our lives benefit from that. But underneath, a lot of our well-being is dissolving with more and more loneliness, alienation, violence. So there's a bit of a paradox there. Um, religion is caught up in that and has always been uh, subject to, to uh, great promises not being delivered and violence and people falling out. But at its best, religion comes from a word religare, which means 
drawing together, binding together. And there is a spirit in human beings that I find with my work with the trafficking, for instance, and the Global Sustainability Network, that draws together people, victims, people from government, from academia, from NGOs, uh, from uh, faith communities, uh, businesses. We bring them all together and there's a spirit that enables people to cross their boundaries, to raise their sights and gain, and actually want to achieve something for those who are suffering and excluded um, at cost to themselves. I think that's remarkable, and I want to be an advocate for that kind of synergy and spirit in people, which just can be too easily neglected by pressing the button and getting the answer that is always just a temporary solution. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Alistair. So this, this week, there's a big event happening in New York, other than this one. There's the, the UN General Assembly. It's the 78th UN General Assembly. And this is the ninth science summit as, as part of the General Assembly. And it's, it's interesting at these global events, whether it's you know, Davos or COP or UNGA, r religion is normally left out of the conversation. But I think outside of business, outside of science and technology, religion is an incredible force that can be used for good and that can make a lot of change. Um, but it's typically left out of these conversations, like I was saying. And so I'm, I'm really glad to be able to bring together this incredible group of experts. And let's, let's start by diving in with a question. Dr. Yusum, I'll pose this, this to you to start. And this is about you know, the belief that there's conflict between science and religion. Right. How do you think about the relationship between science and religion and what's like what, what can you share that that can help us think about that in a more synergistic way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as Scott, you point out, often they're considered strange bedfellows, science and spirituality or science and religion. And so first, maybe we'll give the definition of spirituality versus religion. Right. I see spirituality as more inclusive of um, one's connection to something greater than oneself, whether that be to God or to mother nature or to the universe or to source or to a set of transcendent values like hope, love, trust, perseverance. And religion is um, being involved in a faith community with certain practices, rituals, beliefs. And so religion could, many people who are religious could be spiritual, many who are spiritual could be religious, but you can have one or the other, you can have neither, or you could have both. So there's these four different categories. And where does science fit into this? So often science and spirituality and science and religion are seen as opposing. And the reason for that is because science is that which is reproducible, subject to experimentation, that which you can see with your eyes, hear with your ears, which is empirical. And spiritual and religious experiences are deeply subjective. They could be transcendent, uniquely personal, very difficult to subject to experimentation and repetitive study in this way. But when you bring the two together, magic happens. And this is why I'm starting the center at Yale, the Mental Health and Spirituality Center, because it's been shown time and again that when you introduce spirituality into people's physical health, you have improvement of physiological distress, psychological distress, decrease in addiction, decrease in suicide, increase remission from cancers, increase uh, or reduction in rates of heart disease and heart attacks. So there's all sorts of amazing things that happen when people are open to this and when people are wanting this and it doesn't happen enough. And this is what I'm trying to actually move our world forward in. It's incredible, incredible work. And sort of along those same lines, but a little, maybe a little bit deeper, Creation, Big Bang, I mean, are, are those at odds? Would you like me to take yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, we can all discuss this, certainly. You know, um, one out of eight human biology teachers believe creationism is a very feasible and equal alternative to teaching Darwinism or natural selection. So this is certainly something that's very much in the public consciousness. They don't have to be at odds. The idea that God created the world does not have to be at odds with how the world was created and that natural selection is one of the mechanisms through which human beings and our species evolved. And there's many arguments on both sides, but certainly I don't believe that they have to be. And I think that God who created 
this beautiful world. I certainly believe in God also could have created Darwin natural selection and all the beauty as well as all the conflicts and arguments that is what make our world go round and move forward in part of this dialogue. Great answer. Bishop Alistair, I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of how, how did the Big Bang and creationism come together and mutually work? Well, as just been said, I don't think they're necessarily incompatible. They're different ways of looking at a mystery. And I think one of the things I hope we can explore, and I want to encourage people to reflect upon, and reflect is the word, um, science looks for theories to explain what happens and how and why. And that's very useful. We all know Thomas Kuhn, paradigms change. Um, we might realize we didn't quite get it right. And we have to adjust our science and our medicine and our psychoanalytic techniques. And um, they evolve, they develop. What that says to me is that every human endeavor is imperfect, unfinished, and fragile. Once you begin to get away from a false confidence, creationism, whatever your answer is, and realize we, we can't live by answers. We need answers to staging posts on the way of our journey. But actually the journey is always uncertain, always unknown. And therefore it's this deeper register of faith, hoping that the best can emerge and we can uh, be blessed and progress. But the signs are often counter to that. So that's why religions talk about faith. There's something in the heart that wants to uh, taste blessing, be joined to others, make the world a better place. Often the evidence is contrary to that and knocks it back. So I think rather than just look at those two things, say which is right or wrong, or how do we make a formula to put them together, I want to step back and say, how do we have a discipline? And you've used the word spirituality. I might talk about prayer, which is about how do we reflect on who am I? How are things happening? How do I fit in? How do I relate better to others? Prayer is about asking questions about yourself and the world and seeking a deeper sense of what might be the way ahead. And religions give teaching and ideas and symbols. But unless we're reflective, then... Uh, so I haven't answered your question because I don't believe in answers. I'm saying let's reflect about it. We can we can come to our come to our own answer, right? I appreciate I appreciate that. I mean, of course, religion is about spirituality. Um, when it comes to technology, though, technology we're we're at a place where technology, in a lot of ways, is very divisive, right? But I, I'm still a big believer that technology can be a force for incredible change. Charlie, how do, we, how do we use technology, though, in a way that doesn't sacrifice ethical and spiritual principles and, and really use it as a force for good? That's a great question. And I'm going to go back and answer uh, the previous question, too, in combination with this one. So hopefully I won't hog the mic too much. But and everybody's probably wondering, why the heck did you invite this guy, Charlie, on this panel with these distinguished guests? Well, let me, I think maybe Scott invited me because I have such a diverse religious background. Um, <laughs> let me tell you about the beginning. No, many, many, many years ago, my family, uh, we were the original uh, Jewish settlers in California. I mean, seriously, there's a book about it. It's called 60 Years in Southern California. It was written in 1865 by one of my ancestors, Harris Newmark. Um, and it talked about settling in California. So I, if you do my DNA test, and my wife did, I'm 99% Jew, okay? 1% African, by the way. So that's why I volunteer for a lot of uh, people of color organizations and nonprofits. <laughs> so... Uh, I like to joke about that. I'm a brother too. I'm a Jewish brother and an African brother. But the getting back to the subject, uh, that evolved into my my mother uh, was raised in Christian Science, which is an interesting, spiritually or, oriented scientific religion. And my mother ended up marrying a doctor. <laughs> if you know Christian Science at all, they don't. Uh, they believe that the body can be healed through uh, prayer and thinking, right? And so she married a doctor, which is explains why I'm so messed up spiritually. 
but I was raised a Christian and then I met my wife and I was told that I couldn't raise our children and marry her unless I converted to Catholicism. Okay, so we talked about this last night. We had a um, we had we had dinner last night together and we were talking about um, you've heard the term um, cafeteria Catholic, right? Where you pick and choose parts of religion. I'm a cafeteria religionist, right? Or I try to pick the best parts of every religion. And every part, every best part of every religion to me is about love, right? I mean, think about all the religions. Why do we go to, um, why do we pray? Why do we go to church? And it's the good part about religion. It's all about loving one another, right? I mean, there's a golden rule in every, every religion. Um, so, Am I supposed to get back on the subject? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, but this, I appreciate the background because it, it shows a lot of sort of your value system, right? And how that was created. And, you know, when I think about technology, I think there's a lack of values a lot of times in terms of how these things are created. So yeah, if we can steer it a little bit back and talk to me about like, how can tech be used in a way that's ethical? It takes into account the spiritual, and can can really drive change, right? So, and I mentioned earlier, uh, the company I work for, the Salesforce, they believe Mark Benioff. You know, he founded the company with this one 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 program in mind, and a lot of other companies are now adopting this one one one. And what is, what is that? Oh, it's one percent of equity, one percent of people's employees' time, one uh, percent of profit go to uh, charitable organizations. So, I mean. We're up to like half a billion dollars, I think. I forget what the exact total is now that we've donated. And like when I when I donate to uh, a cause, the company will match it. So that's included in those funds. And then if I volunteer, um, the 1% the of people's time is about 50 hours of paid time off I get to volunteer for organizations. So um, when I do my 50 hours, I get another stipend of company match that I'm allowed to get access to. Also, it's capped at like $5,000, which is a lot of money to do that I can donate to charities. So I, I have a feeling I'm gonna get a lot of calls after this panel, right? But back to technology and what Salesforce does with technology, we um, have a group that's ethical and humane use of our product. So. If someone wanted to uh, leverage our product for um, means like, you know, think of something really bad that somebody could do with on a Salesforce platform, right? We reject that. It goes to a committee sometimes, it's controversial sometimes, but uh, they reject the use of our product for those types of uh, surreptitious or negative methods. Um, the other thing that's really cool about Salesforce is we have, um, and I think every company should have this, there's an ethical use group. And this, our group is held up, um, is held up, it's run by uh, Paula Goldman, who happens to sit on Biden's committee uh, for ethics and AI, which is a whole nother subject, right? And we have a whole group dedicated to how we're leveraging our new AI, the emerging technology that we announced last week uh, they're focused on AI specifically, but also any technological application uh, and how that could be humane, ethical. So to answer your question, it's, um, I think there needs to be an organized group at every company that's responsible for this. So creating, creating a group that can help re regulate or self-regulate how the technology is used and how it's built. Exactly. I think that's definitely that's definitely important and i mean technology really has that power to connect us right uh, in a similar way web3 is all about connecting as well and creating these communities uh daria you've worked on some of the most incredible well-known web3 projects how do you how do you see web3's role as working to facilitate collaboration between diverse groups different communities different religions science groups, technology groups. How do you think about that? 
Yeah, I think that we have lots of to explore in Web3, but at the same time, Web3 is a new opportunity to uh, connect people in one place, uniting them on uh, using equal terms and giving them the opportunity to express their voices thanks to the decentralization of Web3, which allows the creation of equal communities through DAOs, for example, where all the decisions are made collectively. Also, thanks to the transparency of Web3, so we can use it also in in our communities uh, to build them on trust. But at the same time, we see how technology can confirm all the transactions and what is actually going on in these communities. And also it's about accessibility, uh, which allows to different communities to be freely represented. But at the same time, from my point of view, it's very important to note that um, to use these opportunities, education is crucial. And we need to reach people, we need to inform people uh, about these possibilities and how we can use them. And for instance, at Fuel Arts, we are currently working on this and we are creating educational programs for the art universities around the world in order to explain art community, the possibilities of technologies and vice versa. We are working with tech communities. And I think we're, Actually, we're uniting these very two different communities in one place, and we are uh, give them the opportunity to create something together. And I'm sure that it can be done also with lots of different other communities. And also, I want to say that I think that our discussion today is uh, a great example of Web3 collaboration potential because we're here today, we're very different, different nationalities, uh, ages and professions, but at the same time, we're here today to discuss this topic. So I think that is a good start. Thank you so much, Daria. I mean, Web3 has an incredible amount of potential and it'll be, it's really an exciting time to sort of see where that's, where that's going. I think one of the things about Web3 and decentralization is giving power back to the people. It's access. Daria mentioned education, right? That's this equal access to education is incredibly important. Information has, has power. And I guess in the past, and you know, even today still, a lot of religions are sort of controlling, right? And so Bishop Alster, I'm curious your thoughts do you feel that organized religions are ready and progressive enough to start adopting some of these new emerging technologies in ways that are going to give their congregations unprecedented access to knowledge that hasn't necessarily been there in the past? Well, of course, the religious landscape is so complex. The answer would be yes, no, and probably not. But um, in terms of the issues behind your question, um, what I want, would invite us to think about is that, as I've hinted earlier, knowledge is always a partial thing. And uh, Michael Foucault did a lot of work to show that knowledge creates systems of power. People believe something and that controls them, guides them, shapes them. Um, often this knowledge comes from people who benefit from them thinking in that way. So, you know, the whole market system is because people sell things and we think, oh, I need that. That's my knowledge and I buy it um, and I'm controlled. So I think one of the things that religion has to do in this world is to partly help people access the great opportunities. But where religion's countercultural, and some of you may want to comment on this or come back, is that... Um, few religions are democratic and that is because there's a priority given to people who are trained in a tradition and a way of thinking and reflecting that's been tested and perhaps has great heroes and examples and models whether it's jesus or paul for people like me um, and that those things can be very helpful guides in this maze what is knowledge who owns it what's it controlling because they provide a critique about a different um, form of connectivity called love, which you know Charles just talked about. And so 
I think I, I can see religion using the technology to help people come together and link up and celebrate and explore. But it, it, it'll be interesting to me how that dialogues with, there's a kind of ordering hierarchy in most religions. And the hierarchy isn't cheap power. You know, people like me just saying, do this because I'm a bishop and you need, or I'm a priest, you need to do it. But it, it's the power of service to say, but actually when we come to look at this thing, when we come to create this knowledge, when we come to share this community thing, um, there are some reference points our religion thinks are important. Sacraments, teachings, uh, creeds, that we need to bear in mind. They've been given to us in the process of creation by our creator, and we, they need to be part of the mix. And um, there's a danger otherwise. We jettison all that because, you know, that's all old and traditional, and jump into these free-flowing spaces, which could be spaces for more exploitation of gullible people. That's to provoke you, friends. Anyone have a follow-up? Dr. Houston, I, I see you, your wheels turning. I, I um, love that point. I think that's a very beautiful point. Bishop, I think that preserving that which is sacred within religion is one of the most important things for us as a society and a human collective to do indeed. And when we bring in technology and all of these amazing tools that we have at our disposal, especially something like AI, it's to figure out how to do that, to actually promote connectivity, to promote love, and to ensure the safety standards that we as human beings want that any AI or technology that we create can be compliant with. Right now, we have um, a time in our society where um, there's a lot of fear around emerging AI. What's going to happen? How does that affect us as human beings? What it means to be human, our basic structures, our religion, our culture, etc. And the most important thing with that is to recognize that the fears that we have is our, our own projections. And we can't anthropomorphize AI, artificial intelligence, or any technology, actually, with our fears, intentions, autonomy, and agency separate from that which we create in it. We are the creators of the artificial intelligence. And so we need to create it with the right constraints and with the right strongholds to ensure that the values, the ethics, and keeping what we feel is sacred is preserved in the basic structures. And this is very, very important now, especially as people talk about, you know, autonomous uh, AI and um, generative AI that's going to be able to repair itself and these amazing things that we have the technological capacity to do, but also starts to threaten some of our basic structures and the sacredness of those structures. Yeah, so Bishop, as you were talking, I was smiling to myself probably wasn't on camera, but um, whenever I smile, when, when I talk to a customer, it's because I'm, I've thought of a way that I could build an app. And wouldn't it be cool to have an app that was overseen by you after knowing you for a couple days? By the way, um, our philosophy, if you attended any of our sessions last week at Dreamforce, AI is, can't just run willy-nilly on its own. There has to be a human in the loop and if the bishop was our human in the loop on a religion app that always told me the right thing to do in a certain situation, right? I want to be able to ask it, okay, what do I do in this situation, right? And it would combine, uh, be an LLM that leveraged the Bible, for example. What is, what is LLM? Oh, I'm sorry. A large language model, uh, like generative AI capability that goes out and indexes the world, but have it index all the... And maybe not just the Bible, maybe all of the religious works, because they all have common themes that maybe the bishop would appreciate, right? And then he would be, uh, the, we have these things called hallucinations in AI, right? Where they come up with things that um, aren't necessarily true, and they don't, we don't want that fed to the congregation, right? But, and there, there are things called grounding that allows you to ground on the, the Bible. So it should um, grab a citation out of the Bible, loop one or what, whatever. I'm gonna quote something that people are gonna look up and it's gonna be something very evil. So I won't quote <laughs> from the Bible. Uh, my Bible quotations are, aren't very good. Uh, but imagine if we had uh, the bishop in the loop or a group of folks in the loop that could moderate 
these types of responses to their congregation to always have me do the right thing. What's the right thing? What's the right? And I really leverage um, whenever I tweet or I go on social media, I try to express gratitude. And that's one of the ways I try to um, be religious is there, whether or not you think it's uh, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, whatever Buddha, wh whoever's out there, right? There's a supreme power, right? And we should be thanking because back to the big bang theory, right? Even if you go back to the, okay, well, there's a big bang theory. Well, that's scientific. That's how the earth goes. Okay, so who, who pushed the button for that, right? Someone had to push the big bang button, right? So until we get the right answer, I'm religious, right? I rely on religion to praise the supreme being and um, try to do the right thing. So I got way off subject, didn't I? <laughs> Gratitude. I, I mean, I appreciate a lot of things you said. I mean, an app idea to help us make better choices. I mean, that's that's a great idea. I mean, Salesforce has built that for enterprises in, in a lot of ways. Uh, I remember recently I saw an article about a, an app that's using chat GPT to respond as Jesus, right? There's a Jesus app where you can okay, ask there, Jesus. It's already there. It's already right? there. We don't yeah, but I, I don't think there's a human, the human element, which I think is, it's incredibly, incredibly important, right? Could I just interject? I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, I don't know if I, I should be the person on that, but as you know, from what I've been trying to say, it wouldn't be giving people answers. It would be inviting people to think about certain questions okay. into the unknown. And as long as we stop and think at our best, we'll find the right answer because we're creatures who want to love and do our best and love our neighbor. But you need the prompt to stop and ask the question. Otherwise, you just rush on to. So if you could adapt the app in that way, I'm all for it. It'd be great. I'm, I'm excited to download that. So some of the, some of the biggest challenges facing our world are climate climate change right and there's a lot of reports on how do we address climate change and you know the thing that most people think of initially is fossil fuels right but it, it's interesting that the largest bucket of how to address climate change is actually educating girls and providing access to contraceptives it's fascinating how does that tie to this conversation i think Historically, religion has been extremely patriarchal, right? And so I guess how, Dr. Yusum, how do you how do you envision religion maybe shifting to be more inclusive, more, more equitable? I mean, are we gonna have a female pope ever, right? Um, religion is an incredibly powerful force in shaping social policy, our um, response to a lot of our world's problems and of how people think about values, ethics, and as the bishop said, that which is most sacred in our lives. Our environment is very much one of those things. And it's very interesting, you know, we're talking about intelligence and artificial intelligence. And then you look at human intelligence, human intelligence has an astounding capacity. And yet we're also the only intelligence that has brought about uh, but the potential for the destruction of our environment. So this is very real. And now there is a lot of, um, you mentioned a few possible steps with educating girls and contraception, absolutely. And a lot of ways in which we as humans, um, religious and otherwise, need to step in to do advocacy work to change our environment. And science and science policies are insufficient. Um, there's actually something happening at Yale that is very relevant to this. Um, within the Yale Divinity School, they have a Living Village project, which is set to go live in 2025. And this is something that is the first academic center that's a 100% regenerative housing model where it actually uh, produces less energy than, or produces more energy than it uses. And 
the idea here is on the principle of eco-theology, enabling people to become stewards and apostles of their environment, as opposed to, which many of us have done, using the environment for our purposes and our goods, which has led to many problems. And this is um, the idea of the construction and the farming practices and the way in which the students will be involved to leave zero net carbon footprint which is a very, very powerful thing. It's never been done at an academic institution before. And it was very expensive to do. But I think down the road with technology, with AI, with the brilliance that we have, we're gonna be able to solve environment through regenerative farming, farming practices, regenerative hard, hard housing practices. And also, as you said, to ensure that we have more equity, inclusion, diversity in ensuring that women feel empowered over their reproduction. And that too having a positive impact on climate. So absolutely. Wonder, wonderful answer. And I mean, the the vision of a circular economy actually working is it, it is expensive. It is an investment, right? I mean, the economic aspects of driving change are incredibly important. Like we need money to be able to to drive change. Charlie, sort of along those same lines. I mean, technology is a natural way to create a lot of these a lot of these changes and equitable access to education, creation of jobs, connectivity. What what role do you see business playing in terms of giving back to communities versus increasing that economic divide between populations? I mean, we see CEO pay is a thousand times what the frontline workers are the the economic divides are increasing how do we how do we use technology to to stop that i don't want to complain about ceo pay cuz i would never want the job of ceo you can pay them you can pay me a thousand times the workers pay and i wouldn't want to be a ceo i mean all the responsibility associated with that and you know they can, mark Benioff can have he does a great job and um, i back to your question it's business's responsibility to get to sol help solve those problems, I think, because as a result, and we've demonstrated that at Salesforce, our revenue uh, accelerated exponentially, just not because we, we ship great products. I think it's because we're reach, we reach down and help out. It's because of that 111 program I, I talked about before. People want to be involved. Customers want to be associated with a company that's doing the right thing, right? Mark Benioff calls them stakeholders, right? We have shareholders, we have stakeholders. And those stakeholders want to, people feel good about investing in technology where they know a portion of that technology is going to be helping uh, educate women in remote villages in India, which is one of the projects I work on, the Smart Village pro Project. And this is a plug, by the way, you can Google that if you want. Professor uh, Solomon Darwin at Berkeley, uh, he headed up that initiative. And we have um, a lot of people that invested a lot of time and money into that project. And you're right, it's all about infrastructure. So we have companies, we sign up companies to provide, what do you need to get women educated, young girls educated in these remote villages? You need power, you need internet connectivity, which Salesforce can't really provide. But guess what? We have a free education program called Trailhead that they could, if all you need is the power and even an iPhone or, you know, a, a, not even a smartphone, a dumb phone, and you can SMS to it, right? Um, you can get information and you can get educated in these remote villages. If you have the power and you have connectivity. So um, these companies are stepping up. You know, the power companies in India are stepping up, even in the United States. The connectivity companies, people that can provide bandwidth, they're stepping up and that's great. And um, that's how you solve. Ultimately, we can get on top of the climate change issues. And did that answer your question? I don't know, is that what you want? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, you talked a lot about like access and education and those types of things. Back to, you know, accessibility, equitable access to resource. And there's, there's a lot of conversations at the UN about connectivity as a public good, right? Like we have energy, we have water, 
Like, why not internet? Everyone should have access. It should be a human right. Like, this is a, a pretty deep conversation. Daria, what, what role do you see Web3 playing in terms of really working to create that more equitable world? I think that I should say firstly that people is the key element in any changes. And Web3 is just a tool which we can use right or wrong. And if we're talking about right ways of using technologies, I think I will name First of all, financial inclusion, which uh, is possible with Web3, because there are lots of people who doesn't have an access to traditional banking systems. And uh, Web3 blockchain, decentralized finance is their way to take part in the global economy, actually. And of course, it's a problem of um, of migration because right now Web3 can uh, give people lots of opportunities in education, in stable income, in working remotely, which is really good in the sphere right now. It's also about decentralized governance, which I talked before also because uh, like DAOs and uh, blockchain-based vote systems can actually make the system more direct and the process of decision making more inclusive. And Daria, uh, can you can you share what is what is a DAO for those that, that aren't aware? Decentralized autonomous organizations. So it's actually organizations which are based in blockchain and which are have their own governance, which are all based on uh, inclusive decision making. And that's a good model for us as a uh, as a community, not only in online but also offline. Uh, but I also want because I'm working a lot of with artists and I'm working with uh, our tech startups a lot. And what blockchain can do for them is uh, its property rights because lots of uh, artists, for example, right now has uh, can secure their artworks. They can secure their property. But it also can work in the regions where property rights are, are uncertain. So blockchain can also help in this. And the last but not least, I think it's uh, the question of aid. Uh, because thanks to the Web3 technologies, uh, transparent donation and aid distribution through blockchain can ensure that funds reach uh, their recipients. So it's reducing um, corruption. And, but at the same time, I want to say that I'm talking a lot with my colleagues regarding Web3 technologies. And what we are thinking about right now is that we are not in the Web3 world right now. Like we're just in the middle. So it's some kind of digital world, Web 2.5. Uh, and I think that it's really good for us because we still have lots of time to discuss this question, to uh, discuss the rules which we want to see in this world of Web3 in the future. That's that's interesting. I don't know if I've heard of it described as Web 2.5 at this point, but you're right. I mean, the current versions of a metaverse is sort of a joke. I mean, especially if you look at Facebook's, <laughs> you know, remember Mark Zuckerberg's avatar? There's so many great memes about that. Google it. Yeah, I mean, it's a transition period and it's an exciting time to be there watching that, watching that change to, to shift gears. Just just hey, a yeah, Scott, before you yeah, go, go on the subject, I think I made a huge mistake because I didn't shout out to the bishop on his important project. It's just as important as the um, Smart Village India thing about educating young women. And I didn't want to drop that. I mean, human trafficking. So yeah, so this, I mean, this next question, yeah. yeah, I think you, I would love to hear more about that, Bishop Ballester. Specifically, historically, there's lots of religions that conflict with each other, right? And because there's the Crusades, there's all these, all these different scenarios, but they have a lot of common ground. I'd love to hear if, if you can share a little bit about your work, like with the Amar Foundation and how you're working with cross collaboratively in partnership with other religions to, to do something important, to do something good and, and really drive change. Yeah, I mean, 
a couple of examples. Just quickly, the Global Sustainability Network that I talked about earlier, which brings together religious leaders. Um, religious leaders on December the 2nd, 2014, at the Vatican, I happened to be there, privilege, signed a declaration against modern slavery. CNN said the people in the room represented 90% of the world's population. Now, that's CNN, but it's pretty impressive. Really. So the power of religion to come together on these human interest things is enormously important. But a couple of observations, really, and then I'll just say a bit about the Amar Foundation. Um, the context, why trafficking is exploding, for instance, is everybody's free to choose what they want and do what they want, uh, with no, no morality of you shouldn't do that. Um, and therefore, there's vicious, increasing exploitation of children, especially young girls, not least on the internet. Um, governments are increasingly powerless. Uh, democracy, I think, is dissolving before our eyes. It's become ping pong between interest groups and it just does bureaucracy to keep things ticking over. I think the future lies with business. Business is global, people like Salesforce. Business has resources. Business often has a conscience and can focus in a way that often governments don't. And so although we're in the UN, uh, you know, that's a great government initiative. I think in the present context, um, we're committed, the Global Sustainable Network to, and the Mar Foundation, which works with uh, refugees and uh, uh, the Yazidi people and people subject to, to ISIS and, and, and their oppression. Um, business holds a lot of keys and we need to help business make the right contribution. Um, bring to NGOs, we're all small players, religions are relatively small players, but religion has a footprint on the ground. Every person lives in an area where there's a congregation, a worship centre, whatever it is. Business at the macro level, like governments, is trying to sell products and meet people. And somehow, if religion can relate the micro experience and connectivity with the drive of business to help provide resources, we're hearing education and things like that. And of course, religion does have a macro structure. And it's got to learn to work in partnership with people like Salesforce and not just do its own thing about its own inward worship. We've got this footprint on the ground. And we were just talking about gender and the vicious exploitation of young girls. There's a thing about pace and sensitivity here. We in the West see some things as we might call it forced marriage. In the culture where it's happening, it's just how people have always cared for their daughters, found them somewhere to be, received a dowry, you know, it's just how it kind of works. And so there's a thing about pace and gentleness and learning together and trying to do the best for each of God's children. But you've got to start within the context in which people are living and working. You can't crash in, destroy cultures or practices. And so I think we've got to be prepared for a long journey a learning journey, partnership with business and other key operators who've got the capacity and the outreach, and a partnership between religion's footprint in every community, that kind of energy, and how do we find it, in your terms, a common spirit, spirituality, that where we can be united and therefore sensibly and appropriately help people who are being exploited or trafficked or forced marriage or whatever it is. I think the potential is enormous, but organization, this kind of conversation with the, those has to be replicated in so many places to help the connectivity be dis discovered and developed, I think. Thank you so much, Bishop Alistair. I mean, the work, the work you're doing with the Global Sustainability Network at the Amar Foundation, it's inspiring and it's impactful because you can actually see the impact and the results that it's having, which sometimes with some of these initiatives, it's hard because it's such a long, a long tail until you're actually seeing seeing those those impacts. But could I just give one little example? You maybe yes, please. With the Amar Foundation, the Yazidi people, very ancient civilization, five thousand years old. Some Muslims think they need to kill Yazidis because they're seen to be devil worshippers. We've done a lot of work to with the spiritual council of the Yazidi people to listen to them to write down for the first time in history their theology to try and help other people see they're not devil worshippers, they just have very ancient religion.
But in the camps, there's lots and lots of girls and young women who are just trapped. They've been there 12 years now. And we've been forming choirs to get these girls and women to sing their folk songs, sing their liturgy. It gives them a sense of agency, a sense of purpose, a sense of confidence. We brought a girls' choir over to London who sang to, as he was then, Prince Charles, um, and on the radio and things. Um, and that's just one example of how, with a big vision and supported by business investment, you can get right to the real bottom of the heap, trapped in a camp, 12 years, nothing to do, nowhere to go, but through this music, spiritual therapy, begin to get people feeling confident and able to step into the world. And with all your technology, it may be, we can put training into the camps and people might get jobs and do work, even when they've got nowhere actually go and live. So there's lots of hopefulness. And um, I should be chasing up my colleagues on this panel to see if some of those things are possible. Let's that's, do it. That's the cool thing about getting technology to the village. If you get power, you get what? Well, I forgot water. You need water. And you need internet connectivity. Guess what? Then you have to figure out how to maintain all that, right? So you have to train the people. So at the beginning, you're already getting trained resources in those communities to learn how to keep all that stuff up and running, right? Thank you so much. Again, wonderful, wonderful examples. And it'd be, be great to see Salesforce trained refugees working and surviving and breaking a poverty cycle and those types of things being, it'd be incredible. Dr. Yusum, how, how can we think about balancing the benefits of scientific knowledge, technology knowledge, and making sure though that it's still respecting the spiritual side of things traditional knowledge, indigenous type knowledge? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think a place where that question right now is very, very prevalent and pertinent is in the world of psychedelic medicine, especially when it comes to indigenous um, wisdom and knowledge, because right now we have a resurgent with, within my field of psychiatry of a novel form of medicine that really hasn't seen the light of day as a potential treatment modality for some of our most disturbing mental disorders, depression, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, alcohol abuse, nicotine abuse, et cetera, nicotine addiction. Um, and psychedelics are a very, very interesting thing. Some of them are you know, man-made like LSD, but some of them come from the world of plant medicine. So they come from these amazing indigenous cultures full of wisdom and rich with tradition and ritual, such as ayahuasca, such as 5-MeO-DMT, which comes from a frog, mm -hmm. um, such as psilocybin, which is currently, um, there's a lot you know, happening with the legalization, decriminalization of psilocybin at the state and federal level. And so this is a important question that's been debated to figure out how do you preserve for these plants that come from wisdom traditions, the key elements of these amazing societies and yet enable it to be used within our Western medical model, which is a completely different way of using something like this. Ayahuasca, for instance, something that's often done in a ritualized format uh, together. How do you do that within Western medicine? Is there even a space for that? Psilocybin, right? There's so much wisdom in the plant. And the thing with psychedelics, the reason this is so interesting and this is so relevant to our debate here is because psychedelics are the first medicine within psychiatry that actually has not just the potential to change your neurobiology, but also the potential to connect you to something greater than yourself, to really offer a spiritual connection to God, to um, greater presence, to greater self-compassion, to a non-judgmental state of life. And we have nothing like that. And so to study these medicines, to create the right placebos, to create the right policies, the two that are, you know, and, and this also includes cannabis, it includes MDMA or ecstasy, which is being studied for post-traumatic stress disorder, a very, very important question. And there's a lot of work being done to answer it. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to comment? I, I'm not going to talk about the psychedelics, but I will talk about the importance of recognizing, especially in businesses now, um, but the mental health problem and dealing with mental health because um, people are very reluctant 
to even talk about it, right? Or acknowledge that there's a problem. But there's a huge percentage of people that right now that are str struggling with mental health issues. And again, this is gonna sound like a plug for Salesforce, but at our Dreamforce conference last week, we, we, um, we have an award called the Golden Hoodie Award that goes, that recognizes the key members of our community that have re really touched others within the community and given back and, and reached out and gone above and beyond. And we acknowledge someone who created a mental health awareness within Salesforce in our community, it's not a Salesforce employee. This is a, someone in our community. And by the way, our community is totally amazing. I mean, talk about expressions of love nonstop. This is our community uh, represents that totally. But this woman, I won't use her last name, Kate. Um, she was awarded this golden hoodie on stage in front of you know tens of thousands of people recognizing her work and her acknowledgement that she had a mental health issue. <laughs> issue and she's helping countless others within the Salesforce community and even outside the world. So I just want to shout out to that. I want to respond to that, Charlie. I think that that's such a beautiful thing that your company is making this public and is recognizing strides others have taken, both employees as well as perhaps some of the leaders, executives um, within that realm. And people are struggling all the time. We have not made a comeback post COVID. People are uh, COVID um, resulted in huge upsurgence in depression, anxiety, addiction, a lot of neurocognitive issues by virtue of long COVID, et cetera. And we haven't as a society recovered. Suicide rates are still very high. People are still feeling lonelier than ever, actually, according to, you know, even though we're no longer in isolation. So I think it's wonderful that this is happening. And what needs to happen at the level of businesses is vulnerability and openness and transparency in discussing these issues and very clear pathways to be able to provide people with the tools that you're having a mental health issue that's okay you know i have one too and so do i and so do i this is something that people deal with it's normal it doesn't mean you're defective it doesn't mean you're pathologic and here's what we at salesforce are going to do to help you here's an employee wellness program we have here is uh counselors we're going to help you um you know get in touch with and if you're ever feeling suicidal please take some time off because your well-being trumps the you know like our company really if 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 ever anyone's feeling suicidal they need to do whatever they need to do in order to start to feel safe and get themselves back on the ground and feel grounded. Exactly. Beautiful. Mr. Bowser, did you ask quickly, what, what you made me think is, I think there's a, a political undertone to this too. And again, conscious of being in, in the presence of the UN, um, and it's the rhetoric about freedom. We This has got increasingly strong. And what it means for most people is freedom for me to be me. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it, um, exacerbated by my phone. That makes me me, and me is all around my phone and through it. And, of course, something that the religion, which is about binding together, I said, would say is that uh, none of us can be free as an individual. We're made for relationship. That's how we discover who we are, what the world is, how it works. And all the rhetoric about freedom and rights, people are to think of my rights, your rights, your rights, but atomized. And there's an urgent task to discover being bound with other people and that relationships, and you will know as a psychotherapist, that it's about our relatedness and discovering that, and that we're not on our own. And so much mental ill health is because of that feeling of isolation, disconnection, not being able to cultivate relationship and rest in it and be supported in it when you have your down times and struggles. Now that's quite a big political issue. And I think one of the things that we ought to encourage is perhaps an embargo on the word freedom as it's presently used. And can we think of another word that celebrates the individual and their preciousness, but in relationship, which is a different kind of freedom. It is a freedom, it's a bigger freedom to be in relationship. And it gives you so much more. But the word and the concept and rights is pinned it down for the individual. And, and that's why you have so much business, I'm afraid. Yes, but. yes. I, I love what you're saying. Um, I love what you're saying, Bishop. And I feel like 
if I could suggest a word, perhaps the word, actually two uh, word and a phrase, authenticity and authentic relating. Mm -hmm. Authenticity, because in a way we talk about freedom, but when I say authenticity, it's the freedom to know who you really are and to take off your mask. And your mask is that which could make you a people pleaser to your society, to um, your family, to everyone around you, to other people's expectations, to be able to take that off and know who you are underneath that, and to be able to relate to others on that context, to make the relating truly authentic, heart to heart, soul to soul, and not just transactional as so much of relating is. And we live in a world where, of course, we're gonna have many transactional relationships. That's also the nature of many relationships. But when you can have authentic relationships on top of the transactional relationships, that's where the magic happens. That's where the loneliness goes down and you can truly start to heal yourself at the soul level. And, and that's, where, that's where you get into these problems with people thinking that they're not loved, right? And that's where the suicide issues arise and the mental health issues sometimes can surface when you're not able to we have an expression at my my place of work <laughs> uh bring your own authentic self to work with you right if if i'm gay and i feel like i can't tell my colleagues i'm gay that's a bad thing right if you have to hide the fact that you're gay uh or you have mental health issues if you have to hide that and you can't communicate that to your coworkers who you work with 8 10 12 hours a day sometimes right that's a bad thing that'll that'll eat you up so i like to when i speak at events especially with you know in the villages and things folks have to know that no matter what they've done wrong they're loved right they're loved and you'll be loved for what whatever you've done, someone loves you, right? And you shouldn't, taking your own life is like the worst thing you could ever do. To, and there's, and you're hurting there's always others. people. There's always people you can, you can talk to. That's right. right. And if not, talk to me, out. call me. Yeah. My email is Isaac. If you think you're not loved and you're CIsaacs at salesforce.com, I love you. I love that, Charlie. Thank you. Awesome. It is about all expressing expressing yourself, right? And so Daria, I did want you to be able to comment. And I think, I know you are deeply involved in sort of the art world. And when I think about expression, that's one thing that came to mind. So would love to hear your thoughts on this portion of the conversation. I just wanted to add, uh, because we're talking right now about, uh, for example, employees, and uh, I want to uh, talk about youth perspective because uh, I'm working a lot with Gen Z, with uh, Generation Alpha, who are using Web3 technologies, for example, a lot, and they spend a lot of time in uh, in the different social media, in metaverse right now, gaming also, and it's um, I think that we need also to be focused not to replace real world with Web3 technologies and to educate and to tell uh, the youth that Web3 is only a tool to communicate, but it's not the only tool because we still have this real world because I see how many uh, representatives of Gen Z have problems with uh, their mental health, with uh, also suicide questions. And they are trying to find this help in Web3 in Metaverse, but still it's not the same as the help of real person, of a really hug, to have a hug or, or a kiss of the beloved people. So I think it's also very important to note. Thank you so much, Daria. So we're about up on our time here. So let I'd love to give everyone a chance to so sort of just share some closing thoughts. Bishop Alistair, why don't, why don't you start? Well, thank you for the privilege of being part of this. I've learned so much. And it speaks to me of the importance of the interaction between the approaches we represent. It's been like being in a little laboratory. We've been testing out. I come from here, you come from there. Um, I think it could be a model for the, as I said, the kind of conversations and sharing people need to have. Underneath, it's raised for me and hopefully for others, some very significant questions about things we take for granted, 
democracy, freedom, individual rights. And we've got to get behind those things somehow and re-educate people to see that they can be comfortable being dependent on others, needing others, wanting others. Um, desire's got to be shifted from commodities to people in relationship. Um, a lot of the human trafficking work I do, tragically desire is used in the commodity sense. Somebody becomes a commodity, you just use them. And uh, there's a huge challenge then about our language, our understanding, our ability to cooperate and learn together and create laboratories all over the place where a different kind of valuing of humans and human relationships can happen. And that can feed in from grassroots, I say, to policy making and business practice into how we might make a difference and go forward. I'm going to go home and watch this and just reinforce what I might learn from it and then see how I can apply it. Thank you. And are you going to make that app? Well, I'm waiting for a, a call from Salesforce, but yeah, I'm up for it. <laughs> call me. Charlie, go ahead, please. Okay, I've said too much already. I've said enough, but I just want to, and I never don't get the chance to do this on stage when I normally communicate, but I just want to say how grateful I am for, for all of you for giving me this opportunity and grateful to the power. I, I call the power God for, for allowing me to, uh, to re represent such a great company and a great group of people. So that's my last word. Thank you so much, Charlie. Daria, closing thoughts, please. Yeah, um, I'm also very thankful to, to the opportunity to be here today. And I want to say that I'm pretty sure that all the changes uh, in the world begin with us. So uh, we need to try to be as much responsible, as much, um, you know, like really responsible in, in what we're doing and what we are creating right now. And I really think that uh, such type of uh, connections, communication can help us a lot. And I really, I, I really think that it's one part of the big changes that we can make. Thank you so much, Daria. Um, and the comments I'll make are actually with respect to policy things. So if we are indeed addressing some members of the United Nations and we're thinking about how to think about things at the policy level, I believe that spirituality is an independent and very important uh, factor in people's healing from both physical as well as mental illness and needs to be acknowledged as such. And there's a ton of data to support this already. And that it's so important as we are bringing in new technologies, both biological technologies like psychedelic medicines, as well as other technologies like AI to remember to preserve the sacred, like we spoke about. And that also is the sacred power of indigenous wisdom. And that um, we as human beings have to care about others first and foremost, and put the welfare and well being of others above everything else in our lives. And this is why we're here. And this is really what Charlie alluded to as love, really being the currency of exchange in the Western world and that which makes us all tick. And so for all of us to do everything we can to live from that state, to relate to others in that state, to have more authenticity and authentic relating in the context of our everyday life. And I think that will make the world a much better place. Thank you so much, Dr. Yusum. Thank you so much, everyone. I, I'll say I appreciated lots of things about this conversation, but really just the human-centered approach that I think we need in the world, whether it's tech-focused, you know, there's still that human element that's so important. Dr. Yusum, I loved how you said love is should be the currency of the Western world, right? We definitely, we definitely need more of that. So please go out there and love each other.